you know, I've followed some tough acts in my life, but First Sergeant Ducker, sir, um, thank you for uh, such a real, such an honest statement of such a real and such an honest life. And we're grateful to you and those that you represent, because we know you don't stand here alone. To uh, the First Lady and to Dr. Jill Biden for their leadership on the Joining Forces initiative, uh, Colonel Morales for your making the trains run on time and for your leadership uh, in this process. Thank you uh, all um, very much, but particularly um, Kelly Dunn, Earl Scott, what a great job you all have done in seizing the initiative, proving what being American is all about. Um, it also proves that great ideas could happen in a pub. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the ideas that happen on the backs of uh, napkins over a couple of beers are, 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 are good ideas. But we're here in a, in a situation today where there is a confluence of developments that are mutually reinforcing. Um, the winding down of two wars and men and women coming home, the winding down and the winding up of uh, a wireless industry as, as Mo and others have talked about in terms of how this industry um, is, is growing. Let me put this in perspective a little bit. When President Obama took office, <clears throat> about 16% of the American people carried a smartphone in their pocket. Today, it's almost 60% who carry a smartphone in their pocket. And it's not just a phone. There is more computing horsepower on that device than there was on the lunar lander that took man to and from the moon. And that kind of transformational situation where you have portable computing power requires incredible amounts of infrastructure to be able to support it. Mo talked about what AT&T is doing to build a 4G LTE network here. The United States leads the world in LTE deployment. Every other country in the world combined does not have the number of LTE subscribers that exist in our country today. That's great for American business. That's great for American international leadership and the ability to ex export that kind of, of, of technology. And it creates an incredible demand on the need to build out this infrastructure, as, as Mo was talking. Not only demand for capital, $30 billion uh, invested last year in wireless infrastructure in this country, but also uh, demand for uh, individuals and for the folks who are going to be able to build this wireless future. About a billion six hundred, I'm, I'm sorry, about a million, I wish it was a billion, about a million six hundred thousand jobs have been created by this industry since 2007, the wireless industry itself. But then there are derivative activities, about 750,000 jobs related to just the new apps that we're carrying around on our smartphones. And um, so you, say, you scratch your head and you say, let's see, we've got economic growth opportunities, we've got infrastructure needs, we've got investment spending, we need armies of skilled workers to make it work. And what
what a great place to turn, using the term army in the broadest sense to represent all of the military uh, services. And when you can turn to folks like First Sergeant Tucker, you know it's going to be okay. You know that there's a solution. You know that there's progress there. Um, let me just close with a little riff for a second on one thing that happened yesterday. Yesterday was the 150th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. 270 of the most powerful words that anybody has ever uttered in this country. But the heart of that address, at least it seems to me, the heart of that address is where Lincoln challenge is, challenges us to rededicate ourselves to the purposes for which these men gave the last full measure of devotion. But the concept is rededicate ourselves. And one of the things that's really exciting about what Kelly has done and what Earl has done and what First Sergeant Tucker is exemplifying is how that concept of rededication to greater purpose is still being carried out today. And so to Kelly Dunn and Earl Scott, thank you for what you have put together. Thank you for the leadership that you have shown. And to all of you who make this possible, God bless you and thank you um, because you are part of that rededication to the greater purpose that we all want to aspire to. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Wheeler. You know, as I said, it, it's an honor and a privilege, and, and we're thrilled that one of the pioneers of the wireless industry is now the head of the FCC. So next part of the agenda, um, I'm going to introduce uh, first and, and foremost um, our board member, uh, retired Rear Admiral Jamie Barnett. Uh, Jamie and I met uh, three or four months ago. Rebecca Hansen introduced us, and he has been all in right from the beginning. He's working weekends, making calls, and just has been a super, super supporter um, of this. Um, I also want to recognize, while I'm introducing Jamie, uh, Major General uh, Forsyth, who's in the back. Um, and, uh, and then we also, unfortunately, don't have Major General Allen, who's a retired former CIO of the Marine Corps, and soon to be announced, uh, a Rear Admiral from the Coast Guard um, and a three, retired three-star general from the Army will also be part of our advisory board. So we've had every branch of the service represented. but. Um, Admiral Barnett will, will take us through the industry panel. We've assembled a fantastic group of speakers that are going to talk about not only their sectors of the industry, but what their particular commitments are to Wars for Wireless program. So, Admiral Barnett. Kelly, thank you so much. Uh, and as our our panel gets uh, situated here. Um, I'm Jamie Barnett, a partner in the law firm of Venable uh, here in D.C., a retired Rear Admiral. I spent three years at the Federal Communications Commission as the uh, Chief of the Public Safety Home and Security Bureau. Uh, but right now, I'm most proud to be uh, uh, a member of the advisory uh, board for Warriors for Wireless. And it's been said in other ways here, but what we're really looking at here today is taking people who have been trained and have experience on the front lines of national security and with some other great retraining and repurposing, dedicating them then to careers uh, for economic strength of our, of our nation, which is, of course, a component of um, our national security. And the, the folks that we have assembled here today now represent you in the audience, uh, the people that are up here, so Sprint, T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, the other carriers, the, the wireless infrastructure uh, industry, the, the educators, uh, the, the people who will be hiring them, using them, uh, the various equipment manufacturers, all coming together for this. Uh, I've never really seen a, a better win-win. Uh, so let me introduce then to you uh, our panel. 
Uh, to my left and your right, uh, Jonathan Alstein, President and CEO of PCIA, uh, the Wireless Infrastructure Association, where he's been since September of uh, 2012. He came to um, uh, PCIA after serving as the 17th Administrator of the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Utilities Service, which I think where I first met you, a uh, position he was nominated for by President Obama and was confirmed by the Senate. He previously served as Commissioner of the FCC uh, from 2002 to 2009 and had a number of uh, positions, uh, senior staff positions, uh, on the Hill uh, in the Senate. Uh, to uh, his, his um, left uh, is Kim L. Uh, Kim L. is with the Augusta um, Warrior Project. Uh, she is the, now the executive director and served as the um, uh, deputy director previous to that. Uh, the, she'll, she'll tell you a little bit more about it, but uh, this serves the, uh, the warriors and their families in the greater Augusta area, which would include both Georgia and South Carolina, uh, providing them with the resources that improve their lives, uh, energetically addressing employment, uh, homelessness, and, and education. She is herself uh, a, a veteran, uh, a uh, Air Force intelligence officer. She's also a uh, military spouse. She comes from a military family and on several different ways and uh, is a great resource to us here as well. Uh, to, next uh, down the line from her is Pat Finn, Vice President uh, Federal for Cisco. Pat Finn uh, med uh, manages uh, Cisco's growth and integrated business uh, plan for U.S. federal government, including the Department of Defense, uh, the civilian agencies, system integrators, and the intelligence community. Uh, their, their concept is to, the vision is to partner with customers and other uh, companies to enable the government to successfully uh, complete its uh, mission. He's been in the business for 25 years, and I think with uh, Cisco a long time, uh, managing uh, responsible for some $2.5 billion in annual revenue. Next to him, uh, Bud Knoll is the Senior Vice President of Operations for American Tower, and he brings 17 years of wireless industry experience um, to that position with American Tower and, and Senior Vice President of Operations. Throughout his career, Bud has served in various capacities uh, on the carrier side, including stints with Nextel, Sprint, and Light Squared. He has a broad experience in site development, radio engineering, and field operations. Uh, and uh, really, I think you've been with American Tower for three years now, and uh, he has his Bachelor of Science degree from, from East Carolina. Earl, Scout, uh, Earl Scott, rather, one of our uh, uh, co-founders here, uh, CEO of Dynas, and uh, he has more than 25 uh, years of engineering and marketing and information technology and telecommunications industries with Dynas, uh, IBM, and the Department of Navy. Uh, his business, uh, finance, and industry experience, as well as uh, strategy uh, for merger and acquisition transactions has contributed to Dynas' success and growth. Uh, he got his uh, degree in physics from Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, an MBA with emphasis on marketing and finance from uh, Selinger's Executive School of Business and Management at Loyola in uh, Maryland. In 1997, Career Communications, Inc. recognized Earl as the Black Engineering Entrepreneur of the Year, and he's also a member of the, the World President's uh, Organization. Next to him is Rick Suarez of Mystech Network Solutions, uh, a worldwide telecom industry leader as president. Uh, he uh, attended Florida Atlantic University, where he obtained uh, a degree in electrical engineering. He also has a, he's a, a proud alumnus of the uh, University of Miami, where he got his MBA and also a master's in, in industrial engineer. He started with Southern Bell and has had several positions, including uh, a past vice president of construction engineering at AT&T Southeast. Uh, and we are proud to have all of these folks uh, with us today. I think you can see that we have a broad array of the folks that are going to make this such a successful uh, program. When you have the spirit uh, of, uh, of a First Sergeant uh, Tucker in there, that's, that's the, the raw material that they're going to use that's in this great program uh, straight up, and in this case, straight up a tower. Um, so first, I, I, I'm going to kick off with some, some questions, uh, and, and if I could start with you, uh, Jonathan. So could you tell us uh, why a program like Warriors for Wireless is so important to PCIA and its, its members? Uh, what does is, what is the, the future workforce look like and need to be? Well, thanks, Jamie, uh, for moderating. Thank the White House for having us and hosting this fantastic event here today. Such a uh, refreshing uh, opportunity to help uh, our veterans who served our country. We uh, represent the industry that builds infrastructure. So when Kelly came to me with this idea, we were all in, I think, uh, before the, the second sentence. Uh, this is what we're all about. We represent the carriers, we represent the equipment manufacturers, the owners and builders, 
of uh, wireless infrastructure. We're all about getting it done. And uh, I can tell you we face a serious shortage of skilled labor. We can't find enough qualified workers to do uh, the big job in front of us. And that's because you know, our industry, of course, as you've heard today, is in the midst of an historic uh, build out of 4G broadband networks. And with the increasing use of smartphones and tablets, uh, the demand for wireless data is skyrocketing and our networks are really straining to keep up. We're facing a wireless data crunch and carriers are addressing this crunch by building up their infrastructure as quickly as they can along with other tools that they're using. And there's nobody better positioned to help us address this than veterans, the way I see it. Too many veterans are having trouble finding jobs uh, when they finish their service to the country or finding jobs that are, that are good jobs, that are really career paths, that are going to be well-paying, high-skilled jobs. And that's totally unacceptable, especially at a time when we face a shortage of qualified workers uh, in the wireless industry. So W4W will give veterans uh, the training they need to match the commercial needs of our industry, building the wireless networks of the future. That is what we need to have done. We, we recently commissioned a study that found that our industry's investment, investments by companies like AT&T, will result in 1.3 million jobs and 1.2 trillion in economic growth over the next five years. I think we need to make sure that veterans get their fair share of that wireless boom. Uh, we're aiming to do just that by partnering as the premier trade association partner with uh, W4W. They're um, starting immediately by training vets as tower climbers and there's a desperate shortage in that field today. We're gonna help them evolve that. Uh, I think with this volume of activity, uh, we need workers that are properly trained. Uh, this work can be very specialized as we've seen today, uh, working with antennas, backhaul, lighting, uh, and even structural issues. So it needs to get done safely. It needs to get done properly. Uh, W4W curriculum will make just that happen, and there's nobody better to do it than veterans. So as, as the, the present CEO of, uh, of uh, PCIA, I mean, you, you are aware of all the technology trends. What, what are some of the, the technology trends, the industry trends that are driving this? Uh, well, you know, we want to make sure that we expand the curriculum to, to follow those trends, uh, you know, as we are trying to look for technicians that provide uh, what the networks need to meet the demand. One of the issues we're seeing, for example, is the deployment of small cells right where consumers need them most. As you're getting this huge increase, it used to be about coverage. I come from rural America and you want to make sure you get your signal wherever you go. Now with people using huge amounts of data, it's about capacity as well. So the industry is targeting uh, coverage and capacity to places right where they're needed. We're basically splitting cell sites into smaller pieces to densify the network. And that will supplement the macro network where the bulk of the traffic will be carried on towers and rooftops. But small cells will get deployed in buildings, uh, light utility poles, uh, wherever demand is outstripping the supply of wireless bandwidth. Uh, so we're going to try to help through PCIA, through all of our members, really make this a, a effort to make a mission of our trade association, the education of the future workers of this country so that they meet the needs for this wireless uh, infrastructure deployment. We want to expand the training to small cell installation and beyond that to even more advanced radio frequency curriculum. Uh, we'll keep its trainees on the vanguard of wireless deployment for 4G, 5G and even, even beyond that. That way, as our industry grows, veterans' training and careers can grow along with it. Can, can you speak just briefly to, to what kind of careers that's going to be? These, uh, Good jobs, what, what, what kind of career growth would they have? These, these are fantastic jobs. I mean, you, you, some of it's, as we saw in the tower climbing, is manual labor, but it begins they be, as they excel at that. And of course, veterans are perfectly suited, as we've heard, for that. They will rise to leadership positions, become project managers, be, become the crew manager. And, and some people, that might not be for them. You might have a service disabled vet that's not in a position to do that kind of work. We want to make sure that they can uh, do work uh, in designing these systems, having the engineering training they need to be able to design uh, radio frequency networks to make sure that it's done right. Uh, companies are deploying a huge number of these, and what happens is they, they can interfere with each other if they get too close. There's a lot of work to make sure these networks are properly uh, designed, and that doesn't necessarily involve uh, climbing towers. It could involve... Uh, a lot more, a um, lot more technical work on the ground. So there's there's just a huge array of needs in building these massive networks. Our industry invests more in capital investment in this country than any other industry. Oil and gas, uh, agriculture, you name it. More capex is is going on in to the telecom industry, and uh, there's 
a huge number of positions that need to be done. So what we're going to do as a trade association mm. is match what our members are seeing as their needs with the curriculum that we're training people through mm. this program so that when they get out, every one of them is going to have a line of people waiting to hire them. That, that's great. Uh, so uh, I mentioned that Kim L. is the, uh, the executive director of the uh, Augusta Warrior Project. <clears throat> Um, what have been some of the specific ways that Augusta Warrior Project has been able to partner uh, with Warriors for Wireless um, within the, the Fort Gordon community, uh, and, and how can this be replicated in other places? Well, first of all, thanks for having the Augusta Warrior Project here today. A little bit about us before I answer that question. So the Augusta Warrior Project is housed in Augusta, but we service Aiken and Augusta areas, so both Georgia and South Carolina. And we service all service members, so that's all veterans um, transitioning out of the military and that have been out of the military. And one of the things that we've been doing of recent time is really partnering not just with Fort Gordon, but with the local um, universities and colleges, including Aiken Tech, who's here today, and what we have seen is that many service members have been um, very concerned about the transition process, not having a job, going through the ACAP TAP process. And one of the things that we've been discussing recently, especially through the w for w program, is what would it look like if we provided an opportunity for transitioning service members to have some type of employment in place prior to the transition process. One of the things that we're concerned about is that many people wait until they're out of the service or the industry is waiting until people are out of the service. And the longer we wait, the more issues we seem to see with reintegration. And what we're trying to create right now at Fort Gordon with the support of the leadership, our garrison commander and all the leadership at Fort Gordon are really excited about the potential of W4W and what it's creating for veterans in our local area. I've had the privilege to meet a couple of the guys today, the first sergeant over here and his battle buddy Joey, are both from Fort Gordon. And just talking to them about what worked and what didn't work in the transition has had me also realize that by continuing to partner with W4W and the rest of you in the room, we really could be launching something that has never been seen before and really see this as an avenue to really truly make a difference across the country for all services all five services, all transitioning members, and all veterans. Well, you know, that is one of the things we'd like to see is how, how we can re replicate your success uh, across the country. So since you've dealt with transitioning service members and have some experiences, what are some of the key factors that would make that kind of public-private partnership successful uh, elsewhere? So really, I think the key to it is building those relationships, maintaining those relationships, and connecting resources together. So one of the things the Augusta Warrior Project is known for doing is really connecting the dots for everybody. We deal with lots of veterans. We deal with all the organizations in our community and also at Fort Gordon. And one of the things that I see that um, we'll be able to see happen across the country is as a, the Augusta Warrior Project has been asked to take their model to other communities around the country, we're going to be able to take the successes that we're creating in the Augusta, Fort Gordon area, and do that across the country. In fact, we are moving into a location in the next couple months where we can take the work that we're doing. The other piece to that, too, really, is follow-up. One of the things the Augusta Warrior Project um, does is one-on-one -on -one advocacy. And so we service all veterans, all eras, wounded or not, and it's not just about enrolling with the AWP, but it's about being mentored and coached and advocated for throughout the process so that we can help them holistically and completely create the life they want to live into. That's great. So. Kim, thank you so much. You're welcome. So, Mr. Pat, Fe uh, Pat Finn is the Senior Vice President uh, at Cisco. And, and so when you were developing uh, the partnership with Warriors uh, for Wireless, what were the key areas uh, that, that you saw that kind of aligned what Cisco is doing, particularly with your, your IT credentialing initiative and, and spearheading that? Admiral, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here at the White House. Um, I want to first highlight um, Nick Maynard from the White House Technology Science and Technology Office, who actually got us connected with uh, Warriors for Wireless. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not here to talk about what I do at Cisco during the day, but I'm here to represent what we're doing for vets, some of the work that we're doing with universities, Aiken Technical as an example with our network academies, and ensuring that we're connecting, in this case, veterans to jobs. And we partnered uh, a number of years ago with an organization called Futures Inc., which was focused on the credentials, and we built a database 
a portal a couple of years ago that worked. And when we built that uh, portal, the whole focus was to take um, what the uh, military knows so well as their MOSs that we didn't know in the private sector. And so how do you hire someone if you're looking for a project manager and the military is calling it something else? And so what Futures Inc. did with us is we built a, a, a portal and a database where we were able to match military credentials, military skills, and military personnel to real jobs. And in April, when we presented this at the White House, uh, OSD, the White House challenged us on taking that to the next step. And that was when Nick introduced us to Warrior, uh, Warriors for Wireless and said, don't create your own database. It's already, it's already here. How do we tailor this IT pipeline so that we're matching the credentials in the wireless space? So we've already supported over 160,000 servicemen and women who are in our database with 25,000 employees, and we're making that match so that we're talking the language of the military, and the military is talking the language of the private sector. So what we've now done is we've got 100 and, uh, 127 IT employers who are in this database to tailor it to the IT pipeline. And we now want to make sure that we're focusing that in the wireless space so that we can then match our warriors with the wireless organizations. And so it's important for the wireless companies to join as well as to ensure that we continue to build our database of warriors and their skills so that we can actually leverage them and access them. So it's been a great partnership. The White House has done some amazing work connecting us. We're honored to be part of uh, the work with Warriors to Wireless, and we're leveraging the work that we're doing with veterans in our network academies to ensure that they've got the skills at Fort Gordon, at Aiken Technical, um, to ensure that they're the feeders to this database so that we really do connect our employers with such a valuable asset. Only 1% of our, of our nation um, are, are part of the military. And that's the 1% that we really have to be focused on, ensuring that we're giving them jobs as they come home. And this has been Cisco's focus, and uh, Futures Inc. has helped us create that connection. And that's absolutely tremendous. And, and translating what the, those skills are that they gain in the military and, and repurposing them to, to your economic strength. But th there, there had to be some key challenges in doing that as well. And, and, and things with challenges are obviously opportunities as well. Maybe you can tell us or give us some examples of, of what uh, Cisco has done with that. So uh, the challenges are always, you know, when you have the information, then how do you utilize the information? And you have to start with education. We had to educate our recruiters who are very focused on highly technical people to ensure that they understood that we had high, highly skilled people that were coming out of the military with this, these MOSs. And so the first thing we did was we educated our recruiters. Well, to, to, to be honest, the first thing we realized is that we couldn't hire all the military, and so we created the, the IT pipeline with futures. The second thing we did as a company is to ensure that we were educating our recruiters. The third thing we did was to ensure that our business executives were involved and understood what we needed to do. So they were engaged. In fact, we have a lot of business executives who now, for the first time over the last 12 months, have gone out to middle military recruiting events to understand not just who is the paperwork or the resume or the credentials, but who these folks are. And they're coming back very, very impressed that said, you know what, they can fit into our our uh, manufacturing organization, they can fit our partner organization, our sales organization, our engineering organization. So the education and the engagement of our business. And then we realize that we have a group of partners that work with us in order to support our customers. And we can then leverage what information we have and scale it to our partners and utilizing the Futures Inc. and the IT pipeline as a vehicle for that. So not only are we hiring vets ourselves, but we're actually encouraging our partners to hire vets. And so we've taken some of those challenges and we've operationalized it so that we are actually focusing on the good news versus the bad news. And we have a phrase that bad news travels around the world before good news gets up in the morning. So that's why we have to focus on the good news, not so much the challenges, but how we're overcoming the challenges. And I'd say education, engagement, and focusing on the scale 
is the way we're addressing those challenges. Well, thank you so much, Pat. One of the things I love about this is, is this is not only the right thing to do, you're also making, showing it how it's the smart thing to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and thank you for, for calling out uh, Nick Maynard, and I also would recognize Tom Power at OSTP that have been a great, great partners in this. So I mentioned Bud Noel is uh, the senior, senior Vice President for Operations for American Tower. And one of the biggest uh, challenges uh, for the industry is to improve the safety and training for the industry across the board. So, so how does American Tower and, and really others in the tower industry view uh, Warriors for Wireless and, and, and how this will bring veterans into your, your safety, your training, and, and helping the overall goal? Sure. First, let me say thank you, Admiral, and thank you, Kelly, for affording us this opportunity. So obviously ensuring the safety of the men and women who work on our assets is of uh, primary focus for us. Uh, as our carrier customers deploy the networks, um, it's essential that our teams not only know the importance of safety, but demonstrate uh, it through their actions every day. Um, as a result, we, we provide extensive training to our field force um, on a, and also annual certifications to assure that safety is not just uh, a training curriculum, but a part of our culture. We view Warriors for Wireless as an extension of that safety culture. Um, hiring uh, W4W uh, uh, people uh, who have the necessary training, um, returning servicemen who are already know the importance of safety um, only helps us increase the awareness in the field. So um, from a telecom perspective, uh, the benefits expand across the entire industry. Uh, and they increase the overall discipline and skill set of the uh, workforce at the contractor and subcontractor level. Although many of the uh, W4W uh, graduates won't be hired by American Tower, we believe it's immensely important uh, to participate in this program uh, to help uh, our industry and our professionals do the job the right way. You know, um, <clears throat> you did participate in the pilot, though, and, and we appreciate that. And, of course, part of this is to proselytize and get other people to, to be involved in this as well. Can you describe some of the specific ways that American Tower was involved in, in the pilot and, and maybe some ideas and examples how others can help? Sure, absolutely. Uh, we, we participated in, in three distinct ways. First and <clears throat> foremost, Kelly and I met over a year ago, and he asked us for access to our assets, uh, our towers. So he could perform the necessary training and certification requirements. So we were a glad participant on that front. Secondarily, we helped with uh, the development of the training curriculum, as mentioned, at Aiken Community College. And uh, we continue to uh, participate in that and evolve that program. And then thirdly, um, we, we want to hire some of these, these graduates. Uh, we, we have a desperate need for trained workforce, and uh, we will participate on that front. Um, as far as how others can help, we think, um, you know, Obviously, participating in the hiring process is, is a huge part of this. And as everyone's mentioned today, uh, our industry is in a boom, and we could use qualified personnel. So they, they could certainly hire these folks. Secondarily, uh, I think that uh, this program in and of itself increases the awareness of safety, and it will help our uh, others just refocus and double down their efforts on that front. Great. Thank, thanks so much, Bud. So Earl Scott is one of our, our co-founders, uh, CEO of, of Dynas Corporation, and uh, a, a, a co-father of this in another way in that you help incubate, uh, really, the, the pilot program. So when you were, were initially creating the program and incubating it within Dynas, then, you know, what was the business problem that you were trying to solve? Well, like um, a number of the network construction companies, we were tasked with uh, a shortage of individuals in the marketplace. We were fortunate enough to team at Dynas to win a major contract with AT&T to build out LTE services and other technology services within the Waba market, Washington, Baltimore, as well as in the Virginia, West Virginia market. Um, we saw it as a challenge. There was a shortage of crews, um, crews uh, where the prices were starting to go through the roof. And we knew we had to self-perform this work. So we set out, created Dynas Tower Solutions as a subsidiary to provide self-performed services to the marketplace, to AT&T and other customers. Again, where do we find these folks? You guys have heard the story of Kelly and I sitting at a pub. It was actually over at Guinness, uh, one of <laughs> Kelly's favorite beers. And I went to Kelly as an advisor, like I had done for other uh, situations within business and said, Kelly, how are we going to solve this problem I have? And he said, you've got to go 
to the military. That's where I learned my tasks. A lot of good men and women who understand the skills. So you guys have heard the story, but it was the opportunity to find qualified individuals, put them in an environment uh, to succeed. And I can tell you the, the young men and women, and I shouldn't say young, but the men and women who come into our organization have done an excellent job in helping us fulfill the requirements we had with the contract at AT&T. So I'm very proud of the situation. I'm, I'm sitting here today and thinking, didn't think that this thing would kind of uh, blossom into what it has. And Kelly, when we sat down, said this has an opportunity to actually be bigger than Dynas and bigger than what we're doing for AT&T. And as I sit here today, that, that reality uh, is, is definitely uh, in front of us. And I'm very, very thankful, Kelly. I want to publicly thank you for all that you've done. And if we haven't, I'd love to give everybody, to give Kelly a round of applause. <laughs> <'Cause> Kelly, <clears throat> has done an excellent job, and I would say on a limited budget that I gave him <laughs> to actually get started. But uh, it, it's uh, helped really to answer your question, Admiral. It helped solve the problem that we had in addressing self-performed needs for our, for our major customer, AT&T. Well, and maybe you could even go into more depth about maybe some of the examples of how, how uh, it has met those, uh, those business problems or business solutions for you, I guess you'd say, and really how maybe the civilians have reacted to having veterans come into it and, and some of the success stories. Well, I, I will say, too, honestly, it hasn't been without challenges. I mean, we've had to integrate the, the, uh, the self-perform model into our business model. We also had to integrate soldiers into our business model. And I would tell you they were well received. The soldiers were well received by the industry vets. And what you find is that a number of the industry vets were actually military folks. So they understand the culture and the spirit that comes, uh, that came with the actual uh, bringing military individuals into our organization. So it was well embraced. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, individuals were, raising their hand to say, could I have the young men and women on my team and my crews? And, and probably some of the biggest uh, success we've had is when we saw young men and women actually now become crew chiefs, where they're leading the industry. So in a short amount of time where they were trained within the field, they were now leaders. So when we talk about growth and growing within the industry, we had live examples of that within our organization in, in short order. Great, thank you. Well, since we gave Kelly a round of applause, let's give Earl a round of applause for having that vision. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Rick Suarez uh, is the president of MyStack uh, Network Solutions, uh, and, you know, you've, you've had a vision in this. Uh, describe what 2014 uh, looks like uh, for MyStack and specifically maybe how a program like uh, Warriors for Wireless uh, can, can address some of the challenges you face. Certainly. So, so the, the good news with the growth in the industry and the demands of our customer, you know, AT&T, you know, what we've been able to, at this point is to secure, you know, sizable contracts going into 2014, 15, and 16, right, to build out the infrastructure that's coming, uh, coming before us. You know, you sit on one side and you say, great, you know, we've secured these commitments, you know, from our customer. And then you get to the point where then you got to say, okay, now I got to put this plan into action, right? So when you start thinking about what we do today, which is we know this business is near and dear to us, uh, and how challenging it is to manage just the volume that we're managing today, we really have a problem. I mean, it's, it's a real problem. So, you know, uh, fortune brought us together, but, uh, you know, and, and, and Kelly made the announcement. But, I mean, when they talked about this to me, you know, we were talking about other opportunities you know, this is what drew me, right, was to say, well, wait a minute. I, you know, I already know, right, this isn't a hunch. I already know that I have 1,500 jobs to fill in 2014 just for one initiative with my customer. And I know that I have other opportunities that I have to grow in other markets with my customer. We have a national footprint. So the need is certainly there. You know, where I am at today, I can't get there, right? I mean, you know, um, Moses is in the audience today, which is my HR leader. You know, as much as we campaign, as much as we advertise, you know, what we see is a lot of recycling in, in our industry, and that recycling is not a positive recycling. So when we talk about price inflation or, you know, these crews, so we're paying premiums for resources, but we're not getting premium resources, 
right? So that's, that's the real problem. And so, you know, all that does is price up, you know, price up the business, make it impossible to actually build the plans and our customer to be profitable, right? So we need a solution. And that's what this brought to us was to say, okay, when I think about our business, you know, on a personal level, it's a dangerous business, right? You hear about what's going on, you know, in our industry. You know, we've had many deaths already in this industry, which gets back to, you know, we need a different resource running this industry. You, you, you heard, you know, Sergeant, First Sergeant Tucker say it, and, and so, to some of you it might have been subtle, but to me it was, you know, spot on, which is to say you know, his mission was to make sure his guys, you know, didn't die because of his efforts. That's what's missing in our industry. I can teach Right, I can have instructors, but you have to have that passion, right? And, and and the group that we're tapping into, right, that's sort of their creed, right? So what I need is a Sergeant Tucker on every job site that's saying, you guys, the tools are there to never have a fatality, right? But you need the discipline, right? And you need the rigor of somebody making sure that their team, right, does their job safely. I can't, I can't buy that. Right, I mean, so, so perfect match for us. And then the other piece, of course, is the technology is evolving, right? So where eight years ago, our, our teams were bolting down equipment, right? That was their job, was bolting down equipment. Now, now we're talking about fiber optics, right? Now we're talking about, you know, interferences with the network. We're talking about tuning the network where, you know, degree of variance in how you structure that network can mean the difference between the right coverage and poor coverage. So you need to elevate the technical skill set of the resources that are out there. And again, it's a perfect resource pool because many of these folks are already doing this today, but more importantly, they have the discipline in their DNA that when you teach and you put them through the process that they understand that they need to follow that process, right? So, you know, one thing is to be able to adapt and manage in the field the variables that are out there, which I know they can do. But the other piece is also to say, but there are certain things that you have to do a certain way, right, for us to meet the spec requirement to make that technology work the way it's supposed to. And it's there as well. So we were always about trying to get to the military. The problem we always had was how fragmented it was in trying mm -hmm. to reach to those groups where you had to work at a base level and actually try to get folks after the fact versus talking about getting into the pipeline up front to say, hey, we have all these jobs out there, right, that are coming. I can almost forecast them for you. Let me talk to you about that. And then more importantly, you know, at the end of the day, we have to be profitable. So the fact that this initiative allows the GI Bill, right, to be the source for how a lot of this training, you know, comes about makes the perfect marriage to say, okay, I get the right DNA, I get it trained up in a rate that I can't afford to pay it today in my rate structure, right? And then I get the team that's going to go out there and work safely. Right. It's uh, and you know, I think a lot of people would find it interesting that people who uh, join a service that goes in harm's way uh, is so uh, invested in safety. I mean, you have the safety lecture right before you start any type <laughs> of evolution uh, because you. It's one thing to be shot at by somebody else, but you don't want uh, accidents to, to keep your force down. So, well, so you actually refer to some of those, those trains and things. In the, in the tower construction and integration industry, how has uh, really technology training and certification changed, and how will it change? Well, I mean, I, I think this is a game changer, right? Because uh, it does need to change, is the reality, right? So. You know, the traditional approach is you get some kind of sort of, there's a, there's a, you know, a couple good accreditations out there to be, you know, tower certified to climb. Then there's, you know, rescue certified to climb. And, and those are, you know, good training vehicles that are out there today. Uh, but what needs to change really, and, or I should say needs to increment really, is the technology training that goes with that. So one thing is to teach somebody, you know, to climb. Right. Another thing is to teach somebody to get up there and work the technology, right, and understand what you can and can't do with that technology to make sure that it, it fits and works the way that it's supposed to. So in this training today that we're looking at doing is it's not just, you know, can you rig a tower? It's work with the radio equipment, 
that's being installed, the LTE equipment that's being installed. The, let's look at the small cell technology that's coming out. So they're working hands-on with the technology that they'll be deploying, right? And then likewise, the antennas themselves are changing significantly, right? So, you know, in years past, this was a coax connection that, you know, still needed to be done a certain way, but was really forgiving in, in many ways in how, you know, what, you know, how much tolerance there was. Well, so now we train them on fiber splicing, we'll train them on fiber testing, you know, we'll, we'll train them on PIM testing, which are, again, the, the incremental training requirements that are needed to, to, to rig the, the tower the way that it's supposed to be rigged to spec. Today, that's not happening in the industry. Most of that today is kind of OJT, right? So you get somebody that's a greenhorn, you put them out with a crew that's somewhat experienced, and you hope that the guys that are teaching the new person are teaching that person the right thing. But most of what they've learned is really through word of mouth, through you know somebody handing them a pamphlet or whatever it may be. Now, with this program, we can bring that to the classroom. So then again, it's technical training to a specified requirement that the customer is demanding for that technology. And that's not out there today. And therefore benefits that person's career as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so, uh, on behalf of uh, Major General uh, Bugs Forsyth and, and me and the other board members uh, for our, our co-founders, thank you for, for uh, being part of this. And remember, this is a launch. It's not the end. Uh, so the folks that uh, PCI represents, uh, for CTI uh, represents, uh, for the, uh, the various industries, for folks like Aitken, Aitken Technical College and, and the other industry, the educational people that will bring this together, uh, we need to continue. We need to work as hard as Earl and, and Kelly have uh, to, to make sure that this works, not only for our veterans, but for our country and for the industry. Uh, and if you would, uh, please uh, join with me in thanking our panelists. Um.